Hi, everyone. I think there's a few people joining. Uh, we'll give it a few minutes and then we will start. Okay, let's start. So this is a webinar that we're doing for Algo Trading for Beginners. Um, we hope that you have a lot of questions. This is meant to be very interactive. Um, so please ask any questions that you have. There's actually a question section and a chat uh, section and the poll section. So if you have questions, please make, make sure that you ask them in the questions tab and you can also upvote other people's questions. Um, we are also giving out a coupon code that is one month off for the alpaca market data. Um, we'll give it at the end. You guys can redeem it. And, and after that, it will start charging. So please make sure that you are aware of that. If by any chance you already are paying for the market data plan, please contact us directly and we will make sure to give you another code because I don't believe it will work for you. Um, and we made a Slack channel. Um, maybe I, I can share it here. I'll send it in the chat. It's a Slack channel for, you know, the group that, like the group of us. Um, so yeah, you can also mention anything there. And yeah, so I'm Maria Angela Martinez, um, content marketing for Alpaca, and I'll hand it off to Rahul now. Hey everyone, my name is Rahul. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Maria Angela. I'm a software engineer here at Alpaca, and today we're gonna do another webinar, similar to the last two webinars, where we kind of dig into Alpaca and algorithm, algorithmic trading as a whole. Um, this webinar is a little bit different though. The last two webinars, we focused on the process of algorithmic trading, uh, things like how to come up with ideas, do research, build and validate those ideas, and then actually test them and deploy them. But this one is gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna focus a bit more on the basics, get into what Alpaca's dashboard environment looks like and how to use kind of like the basics of the API. And this is meant to kind of, this is meant for people who want to kind of get their feet a little bit dirty, just kind of like, uh, you know, dip their feet in the water and start getting, getting started with Alpaca. So again, some of the goals of this webinar is just to get a familiar ourselves with the Alpaca's dashboard and API, and also kind of get some Q and A uh, going and answer your questions directly, get some real questions from real users. Okay, cool. So. Overall, the content of this is going to be first, we're gonna go over the dashboard and we're gonna go over like what the various parts of the dashboard are, um, where to find the API keys, et cetera. And then we're gonna go into the API and how to use the documentation to actually work with the API when you're building something. Um, and we're gonna to try to build an intuition between how things you do on the API affect things on the dashboard. Um, and you know, so you can keep track of how your algorithmic algorithms are actually working or not, or how they're affecting your account. And then we're going to spend a good amount of time on Q&A, try to answer your questions as well. And finally, at the end, we'll have some resources to hopefully help you on your journey on automated trading. Cool. So I'm going to just jump into the dashboard here. Here I have a demo account kind of showing what a typical dashboard of a user might look like. So this is a live account here. Um, and of course it's demo, so the, the API keys aren't real and they don't work, but it's a good place to start on kind of like going through what the various parts are. So of course the main part of the dashboard, we have the portfolio history chart, which kind of shows you in different timeframes, what your portfolio looks has looked like, or it looks like today. Um, and then on the bottom, we have our positions uh, that are in this portfolio over here. There's a few different crypto and stock assets. And then on the right hand side, we have various things like letting us put in uh, orders for SPY or other assets. We can also get our API keys, which we'll use later on in the API part. So on the left hand side, we can see more in detail, things like details about our positions, uh, of course, like PNL for every specific position that we have and asset allocation. We also have the open orders and closed orders that you 
might have for your account. Um, over here, we have the activity. So account activities include any transactions. This can be orders, um, transfers, you can dividends also show up. And there's a distinct difference between stock and trade, stock and crypto trades here as well. Here, account configuration, and we'll come back to this later on, since you can control this from the API, things like essentially controlling limits for your account. For example, maybe you want to not allow fractional trading or check if you can, you know, prevent uh, pattern day trading, uh, preventing yourself being, from being marked as a pattern day trader uh, when you give when you want to make a trade. So, for example, let's say I make it. Let's say I would have made a trade that would have marked me as a pattern day trader. You can implement a protection uh, for that. So. We also have crypto transfers now, so you can make deposits to your account using uh, this wallet right here. So for example, let's say I want to deposit some Ethereum. I can use this code or this QR code here to, well, this address or this QR code that represents the address to uh, deposit any crypto. You can also make deposits using the banking feature here. So for example, you can link your US bank account or make a wire. Um, and make a deposit this way as well. We also have this new section called the Developers Hub, which is growing. This is more for learning. And we have some articles here right now that are, you know, kind of just help you get situated, not with just Alpaca, but trading and algo trading in general. You know, things like building a bot or different order types. Alpaca Connect is this. Uh, well, well, we've had it for a while, but we haven't had it on the dashboard. Essentially, Alpaca Connect lets you connect your Alpaca account via OAuth to third-party applications. So over here, you can see them here. But if I go on this other one, so you can see some examples here. Um, so for example, we have Trellis, which lets you create bots without writing code, um, and some other really cool ones as well that let you manage your account uh, using third-party services. Cool. So this is kind of the overview of the dashboard. I wanted to go over this before we jump into the API, because as we write code, what we'll be doing is kind of just, uh, looking at how it's connected to the dashboard. So again, we're not going to be diving too deep into the processes of algorithmic trading in pre if you, if you're interested in how to research ideas, how to back test ideas. I would look at the previous webinars, but this webinar is mostly focused on the fundamentals of Alpaca and just getting our feet, getting our hands dirty rather in uh, working with Alpaca's environment. So, you know, how do we, how do we get started with using the API? So if, there's a lot of, we, you can use the API directly and we have API documentation, uh, to that tells you each of the parameters uh, that each endpoint takes. And you can use curls or your favorite language of choice and its request library to make those uh, uh, API calls. But you can also use one of our SDKs that essentially take each of these API endpoints and make them into functions that you can just use. So the one I would recommend is probably the Python one, one because it's the most popular by far and it's pretty easy to pick up. So. For the Python SDK, you can easily install it just by running the, the pip install of PocketPy. Pip, the uh, Python package manager, will just uh, install it into your machine and you can use it in your projects from there. So what's special about the Python SDK is that we also have a documentation site uh, for it. And that documentation site has tutorials that you can use and examples and also in whole mark API reference as well that lets you uh, kind of explore the uh, SDK without diving into the code too much, the source code rather. Um, Rahul, there are a few questions uh, before we move on. Um, mm -hmm. One, can we wire the account with WISE? So with wire, make a wire deposit with WISE? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure here off the top of my head. I would, I would, 
I would save that question, maybe uh, ask it uh, in the Slack channel. Uh, this okay. is one of those like ops questions that I'm, I'm not sure about. Perfect. Um, another one, is there a minimum account balance needed for day trading on the live environment? I've been hearing 25K and wasn't sure. So this is a good question. So it's a common misconception that you need 25K or more to day trade. Um, you, so you can always, you can place a day trade. There's no account minimum. The 25K limit pertains to a, to day trading, placing unlimited day trades within a five day period. So if your account is under $25,000, you're only allowed to place five day trades uh, within a five day rolling period. And a day trade is when you buy a security and sell it on the same day, or you sell it short and buy it back on the same day. Um, so there is no account minimum, but if you want to place unlimited day trades, like a hundred day trades per day, then you'll probably, then you will need $25,000 in equity. And that's specifically for stocks. Uh, the same doesn't apply to crypto. Okay. Awesome. Um, there's another one. I want to execute, um, a fraction trade, but Alpaca API is not allowed if the order type is limit order. Yeah, so fractional orders are only supported with market orders right now. It's just the way that fractional orders are implemented uh, on Alpaca side. So that's just unfortunately a limit we have right now, only market orders. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, another one. What, what criteria will flag as pattern day trader? So a pattern day trader is any, so I, I don't have the exact legal, uh, you know, the exact uh, description here, but uh, as if you were to put it in like legal terms, but it should be for, it should be any trader that places four day trades or more within a five day rolling period. That should be a pattern day trader. Yeah. I, I would, I, I wouldn't quote me on that one. I would definitely look it up um, again. Not so, not so sh not 100% on all the uh, legal things here, more about the technical things. Okay, perfect. Um, let's move on and then we'll keep answering some questions. Just remember guys that you can keep uploading the questions that others ask. Okay, cool. So where were we? Um, right, so we're talking about the dashboard and now we're gonna jump into the API. Now that we kind of have our whereabouts of what the dashboard kind of looks like, and we kind of want to jump in and write some code that interacts with the API and starts placing orders, let's say. So, um, right, let's say we install the Python SDK, which lets us interact with our, um, with our a account via API, and we want to start doing things. Let's, and there's a few different things we can do, um, right? One of those things is access market data. And Market data comes in various types. Uh, there's bars, and this is what you typically think of, right? When you look at charts, you see candlesticks. If I look at SPY right now, let's say, and I see these little bars here, and those are, those candlesticks is, let's say, maybe what I want to retrieve. I would, I would want to retrieve bars. There's also quote data, and this is essentially bid and ask data uh, for that specific security. There's also trade data, and that's essentially the last transaction or the transactions that have occurred on the market for that security. And we also have order book data. Um, this only actually exists for crypto. For example, if I go to BTC USD, on the left-hand side, I can see the order book. Essentially, it's the level by level uh, uh, qu quotes for each, uh, for that security. So for example, I have um, 11.683 Bitcoin uh, order at 24,586. So that's above the current price and that's an ask. Uh, so that, that's, that's how the order book, uh, we, we also have order book data for crypto. So data can be accessed by REST API or WebSocket API and they have different use cases. So REST API, if, if you're familiar with that, essentially is a, sesh, is a sessionless 
or a sessionless transaction with the API to get data. And you can most, most of the time you'll be using it for getting historical data. And a WebSocket is like a continued session where you retrieve data as it arrives. So for example, real you might use it for real time data, getting bars as it arrives. So the latest quotes as it arrives. And they can both be used for creating algorithmic trading strategies. Uh, if you're interested in that, I would definitely look at the second office hours. We go really deep into uh, real time data and using it in trading strategies. Cool. So I have some screenshot here, but I actually want to jump into some real code and show how to use a documentation to uh, play around with the API and actually start, you know, getting data and placing orders. So let's say I want to get some real time, or well, rather historical data using the REST API, and I want to get some bar data. So what I want to do is first buy, I want to get the last year of data. Let's say this chart over here, right? Um, Hold up, let me get out of the staging one. So first by get since essentially this chart, but I want to do it via the API because then I can use it in my automated strategies, you know, start calculating indicators or start, you know, calculating price levels, et cetera. So how I can do that is well, using the SDK, I can go over here and find that, okay, there's an example for retrieving historical bar data. Um, if you're, you can use the examples here, or you can also go into the reference and play around it on your own. For example, if I want to go here, eventually, you know, you, over here, you can find the get stock bars, which returns bar data for any equity. Um, but getting, when you're first getting started, it's kind of helpful to use the examples because you already have code written out. And you'll notice that this example is for crypto, but it will be easily, it's kind of easy to like change it around and make it work for equities. So let's take our example and kind of shift it around. So I have some code here in the top that I'm just using for getting this environment set. Um, I think I'll jump into it right now and then I'll explain. If you're interested um, in this, I'll share the, uh, new book, but essentially I have some code here that lets us run like async IO, uh, streaming within the journal of Jupyter, Jupyter notebook, um, and making the backend plotly because I like plotly more than matplotlib. And over here, it's just kind of like a pip install, uh, that lets, that installs this library. And we also have pip install for alpaca pie, which we'll be using for getting the data. I'll share this so you guys can play around this and, um, and see how these libraries work up here. Okay, so this is the code I just copied over from the market data section of the Alpaca Pi documentation. And it's the code similar to what we want, but not exactly. So how do we change it around? We'll notice that this is a crypto historical data client. Um, what we want is a stock historical data client. And we noticed that actually it's pretty similar, except the stock historical data client actually takes API keys. We don't need keys for the crypto data at all, actually. Crypto data is, uh, can be accessed without authentication. Um, it's different for stock data. So I'm gonna just copy over this bit of code because that's what we want. We wanna get data for SPY. And we'll notice that we'll need API keys. So let's get the API keys from our dashboard. If we go to the front here, we can go to the right-hand side and generate the keys. And you'll notice that these are paper API keys right now. It doesn't really matter when you're talking about getting data, but when we'll be placing trades, it will matter that these are paper API keys. Okay. Cool. So now we notice that Okay, we have the stock historical data, but it's throwing an error. So let's actually import not the crypto historical data client, but the stock historical data client so we can remove that error. We don't need this comment here. And we want to, instead of making a crypto bars request, we want a stock bars request. 
Now, this stock bar's request essentially is the object that contains all the parameters for that API request. So for example, um, the get bars, the, the bars endpoint on the API takes the symbols as a parameter, the time frame, and the start and end dates. And these essentially become variables within this uh, or fields within this object. And let's do it for spy. And let's do it for the entirety of 2022. So it's a bit more, we, we know what to expect from the chart. And from the client, the method now is actually get stock bars. So if we're ever confused about this, we can of course look at the charts, but um, look at the uh, examples rather, but another way of doing it is jumping into the reference. So market data reference, the stock market data here, historical data. And you notice that these are all the methods is get stock quotes, get stock trades. But the one we want is get stock bars. And you see, we see that it's tied to the stock historical data client. And it takes these request parameters, which is the stock bars request. And what's cool is that we can take our response and convert it to a data frame. And this is nice to do because it's just easier to view uh, what's going on. Cool. So this is essentially that data for over that year um, from 1st of January to December. But it's hard to visualize, right, that we got the same data um, as in the dashboard. So maybe one thing we can do is actually just chart it out. And I had this code uh, ready, just kind of set here beforehand, just so we don't have to jump around uh, documentation too much. But essentially, this code lets us use Plotly, which is a charting library, to take this data frame and chart the open, high, low, close as a candlestick chart. So what I'll do is I'll call this I'll call this, uh, I'll name a new variable data frame, which will be the bars.data frame. And we'll take that data frame and that data frame is a multi-level, uh, multi-index data frame. If I take a look, there's symbol and there's timestamp. I want to access all the data for spy. That might be funny because, you know, we only have one symbol, right? There's no like need to have multi-index uh, multi data frame here. But if, if we had multiple symbols, it's a bit more obvious how that works. Uh, the, the library is agnostic to the number of symbols. So it behaves the same if you have one symbol or 100 symbols. You still apply the same operators on the data frame. So we can access it that way. And then over here, essentially, you create this platly graph object where you define the open, high, low, close. And you can plot it out. It's kind of cool because essentially what we did is use the API to get the same data that's on this that's that's on this uh, dashboard. Pretty awesome. Cool. So moving on, uh, kind of just talking about the next way to retrieve market data is the WebSocket API, which lets you essentially stream data. Um, so instead of making one transaction and one request, and then you get that data and the transaction is over, the data keeps streaming to you as long as it is available. So again, we can use the documentation here to get an idea of what that code looks like. So over here, subscribing to real-time quote data, And all these uh, imports, um, you know, I'm not jumping into too much because we don't have that much time. But um, if you're interested, I would definitely go through this code uh, either on in the documentation and kind of play around with it a bit. Uh, so again, you in, you implement another, you instantiate another client, uh, and here I'm going to supply the API keys again. So let's grab it and. And over here, the way the web cl WebSocket client works is that I have to assign a callback function 
which handles the data as it arrives. And we need to use an asynchronous function here. And that was the reason we had all these, uh, this import specifically, this, the use of this library. It just allows you to do it within a Jupyter notebook. Um, so yeah, so we have this stock data stream client and we want to subscribe to quote data, let's say. So this is the real time stream of bids and asks in the market. So this is a lot of data, right? As you, it's probably changing, you know, many times within a second. So when we do run this, uh, you know, once we subscribe to the quotes first by, uh, and you pass in the quote handler, um, that we defined over here. So this is a function we defined on our own and you can actually pass in multiple, uh, multiple, uh, symbols here, uh, in the, um, up to 30 symbols, if you have a free plan, but an unlimited number of symbols, if you have the premium subscription. And once you've made all your subscriptions, you can run the website client and you can also unsubscribe in future points if you want to uh, stop streaming for a specific uh, symbol or a specific data type and or you can completely stop the WebSocket client as well. So let's give that a run. Let's see what that looks like. So this is a lot of data, so I'm just going to stop it right away. No, let me run it one more time. So I actually just ran it twice. Give me a sec. Okay, so we, we missed it, but let me, the issue is uh, I, I, I server, the server connection got rejected. So there's some live debugging right here. Let's see if we can fix this by just changing the type of data. Connection limit exceeded. Um, let's come back to this one. I think what's happening is that there's like a, uh, uh, th th there's an issue with the WebSocket client here. Uh, the connection here, um, and we still have the con the connection is still lingering, and that's why we're getting rejected by the uh, endpoint right now. And uh, yeah. there are a few questions. So one, is it possible to stream data in Collab, or it should be a client side app? Could you repeat that? Is it possible to stream data in Collab, Google Collab, or it should it be a client side app? So Google Colab is just an environment to run code, right? Um, it's a Jupyter Notebook environment. So you can stream, runs WebSocket connections from Jupyter Notebook. Um, of course, there's some extra things you have to do, right? This is specific to Jupyter Notebook environments, but you can stream uh, via WebSocket connections on Jupyter Notebook, if that, an that answers your question. Okay, and then another one, what is the minimum time interval for uh, for get bars? I see in your code that the interval is day. Can we go for a minute, for example? Yes, you definitely can go for a minute. Uh, and you can use customized, uh, customized time frames as well. So if you want three minutes, two minutes, um, I think there's some examples here, although I don't know if it's on this page. But yeah, the lowest is a minute, I believe. OK, thanks. So although, yeah, so just first question, right? I am running into an error here, but it is possible. It's just because I pressed it twice by mistake. I double clicked and, oh, cool. Awesome. So check it out. We have trade data right here um, and it's arriving here. So these are transactions that are occurring on, in the market. So we know what exchange it is. And this is an exchange code. Um, I forget what V stands for here in this example, but you can look it up on the API documentation which exchange codes correspond to which exchanges. It's kind of cool. And you have the size and the price that transactions are occurring at. So that's how the WebSocket clients work. Um, and again, um, you need the API keys here in this case for both the stock data and the crypto data. So for crypto historical data, you don't need authentication, but for crypto real-time data, you do. So now we're going to get into the fun part uh, because we'll be able to see how the, we'll, we're going to jump into orders. And now we'll be able to see how placing orders via the API actually affects our account because the other ones aren't really actually related. The market data endpoints aren't really related to uh, managing our account. So Alpaca allows you to trade crypto and stocks from the same brokerage account. Um, 
So it, you know, with the money you deposit, you can be, you can trade both stock and crypto and you can place a variety of order types. You know, you have limit stop, uh, ACO, which is one cancel order, one cancels other, or you have also one triggers other. Um, there's also a bunch of others like fill or kill orders. Um, but a few of them are restricted uh, to stocks and they don't exist in crypto uh, as of now. But uh, the goal is we'll be able to have all the order types for crypto as well in the future. So you can also view and manage your positions um, uh, via the dashboard or the API. Um, let's jump into some code so we kind of see what that looks like. So over here, I'm going to use a paper account here uh, to start placing some orders. And if we go to the head of the dashboard, we see that this is a brand new paper account with no portfolio history beyond today and no assets. Let's gen we actually already have our API keys, so we don't need to generate it. And we can just kind of jump in. Again, let's use the uh, documentation to our advantage. Uh, there are some good examples here that we can use. So first here about paper trading, um, it's important to note that when we, whenever we instantiate the client uh, with our paper trading keys, there's also there's always this paper is equals true we can set, uh, just so the client knows that these are paper keys, and this is specific to the trading client. We don't, the market data clients don't care whether you have paper keys, or uh, live keys because market data doesn't pertain to a specific accounts management. So let's start off by submitting an order because we have no positions in our account. So I'm going to go over here and see that we can use this code to generate a market order. So let's bring that over. So I'm going to copy over the API keys here again. And these are the same paper API keys I first generated for my account. They work both for market data and for trading. And again, I have the paper equals true. And so m submitting orders, uh, requests for placing an order work the same way uh, programmatically uh, in the SDK as submitting a request for data. You have this a request object that you fill up with all the uh, parameters that determine which order you want to place. So over here, let's say I want to place an order for um, SPY. And I want to place a fractional order. Um, let's make it like 1.5. And I could go short. I can also go long. So for example, if I put sell here and my account is enabled, has shorting enabled in the configurations, this will create a short position. So let's actually make a short position. Let's see how that turns out. And the time in force in day just means if the order isn't filled by the end of the day, it will be canceled. And this is a market order. So it should be filled hopefully right away if there's enough liquidity. So we're going to submit the market order using the trading client. So there's this method called submit order, and you can use that for every order type. You'll notice that for market, the, the order type is encapsulated within the type of object we create. So there is a limit order request object, which you can use to create limit orders, but we'll be only creating the market order request here. And I'll print out the response just so we can see what we get back from the API once you created that order. And inside of the submit order method, so trading client dot submit order, we pass in this data that parameterizes all the details of our order into this order data variable. Fractional orders cannot be short. So we're, we're learning that it's cool. So we we just saw that uh, actually we ran into one of the uh, restrictions on the API. So we can we can place fraction orders only for uh, long only and market orders. Uh, so let's go long. And we get all these data back. And this data essentially contains all the details of our order at the time of submission. So in this case, it should be filled. So we it's not filled right away. So at the time of submission, it hasn't been filled. So uh, I assumed it would be filled because it's a market order, but it wasn't filled immediately. And we had, if for a limit order, we would expect that it might not be filled. It would not be filled immediately. And see that it hasn't been filled. So there's no filled average price. 
Um, there's probably a better way to print this out because I'm going left to right, but uh, you can see that all the details are here regarding uh, the uh, details of our order at the time of submission. Cool. So now let's see how that affects our dashboard. We see that our uh, PNL is actually already changed, even though we bought only a single share. So we're up. So that's a great. Uh, we're up 12 cents so far. And we see that we have fractional shares of 1.5 share uh, in SPY for uh, that has actually been filled. And if you go to orders, we see that there has been no open orders. But if you look at closed orders, we see that it was filled at it was actually filled a second after we submitted. And there was no fee associated with it. And we can see even the source of the uh, order. And if you go to the positions tab, we now see that we have some SPY in our positions. And still, most of our allocation is to cash with uh, less than 1% allocation to stocks. Cool. So now, let's take a look at how we can get our positions from the API. Of course, this is useful uh, for determining when you want to exit a position. So let's say you've, you've used the API in your automated strategy to enter a position, and at some other point you want to rebalance. You'll need to look at what positions already exist in your portfolio. And it's much easier doing that by the API when you're trading automatically, uh, algorithmically. So let's do that. Um, jumping into the documentation one more time, we get to positions and we find that there is a getting, getting all positions endpoint. And there's also a close all positions endpoint. We'll just get the positions for this demonstration. Uh, we can also close positions specifically. So again, these examples don't cover all the cases. They're just examples uh, to kind of get you started. If you want to see all the possible things you can do, so if I go to trading client and I go to positions, there's get all positions, get an open position for a specific symbol, close all positions, close a specific position. Um, so if you really want to know what is possible throughout the SDK, I would jump into the references. So again, going to trading and I'm going to get all positions. And we'll have to set paper to true here. And get the keys. And we see that we actually have a single position in the uh, in the uh, account. So how can I tell that? Well, we get back a list, and the list contains is these position objects. And each of these each of these position objects contains information about that position. So we see the symbol is SPY. We have 1.5 shares, market value. And we can actually access uh, each of these values. So for example, let's say, let's say I want to get the market value for one, this position. I, I know there's only one symbol in there, one position in there. So I can just access the first element. And let's say I want to get the symbol. symbol rather. Hi. And market value. So that, that's how you could do it. You could theoretically loop through it many times. And if I place an order, let's say through the dashboard, let's say I go through the dashboard and I place an order for Bitcoin. USD, and let's say I buy one whole Bitcoin, because why not? Um, let's see if we reflect on our, okay, it immediately reflects on our positions on the dashboard. Does it reflect on our um, API? Let's check it out. So I'm gonna get on here and print out positions. So we have Bitcoin here. And we also have SPY down here. Um, the formatting here is might not be the cleanest, but if you print it out, look through it for position in positions, let's say, I can print out a position dot symbol, position dot 
market value. So that might be a little bit cleaner. So Bitcoin, I have $22,000 and SPY, I have $597. Cool. So that's kind of like the trading part of the API. So um, yeah. there's a question actually. Um, so there's one, okay. Can we allocate dollar instead of, instead of quantity? For instance, I want to buy a thousand uh, Apple. Yes, you can. Very, yeah, you can. So um, the way you do that is by uh, defining a, instead of defining the quantity parameter, defining the notional parameter. So let's say I wanted to buy $1,000 a spot. Um, let's check that out. So instead of looking through here, let's just look at the dashboard for now, since it's a bit more clear. And I have an extra $1,000 a spot. So notional does work as well. And you can apply that both for crypto and stocks. Uh, it's good. It's good to know that you can't use notional and quantity at the same time. And that, that will throw an error. So if I did this, this will throw an error. Let's just give it a shot to see what it looks like this error. So you get a validation error, both quantity and notional cannot be set. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, any other questions? Um, let me look. Okay. Um, are the details that come back after an order is filled also available to query later on through a different API call? So specifically you have the order IDs. So like, um, you want to save the order ID. So let's just create a new order to see what I'm talking about. Uh, so you have this order ID here. And this order ID is useful for retrieving details about the order later on. So um, you can get all orders. This, this returns all open orders, but it can also return all closed orders if you specify it. So open orders by default, closed orders um, if you specify. So I can also use it to get a specific order. So for example, I want to get a specific order by its ID. I can save this order ID at the time of submission and later use it to query details about that order. Cool. Thanks. Um, okay, let's see this one. Are there guardrails in place if you accidentally provide live API keys but specify paper equals true? In other words, will Will it it either error or prevent live trading? Yeah, it'll it'll error. So if you submit, if you use try to use paper e keys on live endpoints, you'll get it'll it won't be authenticated because it'll see in them it'll see them as incorrect keys. So paper keys only work for paper endpoints. Live keys only work for live endpoints. They're essentially uh, uh, two different uh, parts of the API. Yeah, two different APIs. Okay, thanks. Um, what is the best way to append real-time data from a WebSocket to the historical data, data data frame? So this is like a question of like uh, efficiency, right? So in general, it I believe it's like not efficient to append to a data frame. Uh, well, maybe not the most efficient way, right? But it can still be done. There's a lot of ways to like approach it. I like just getting the latest data point using the REST API and re using the REST API. So if you go to the REST API, um, you can use it to get the latest uh, data points. So what do I mean by that? So get latest quote, uh, get latest trade, get latest bar. And when I do the get latest bar, it'll return the latest minute bar. Um, of course, I can stack them together and uh, make five minute bars. This is one way of doing it. So just getting that data. Um, and so, okay, so I'm, I'm kind of viewing off your question. So your question is specifically the data frames, right? Um, yeah, you can append it, right? Uh, but there's other ways of doing it. Um, you could create a new data frame, right? That is just getting the, making a new API call for all the latest uh, bars, let's say, up until the new data point or up until the new timestamp rather. So 
let's say it's been five minutes, just get again the last 20 bars. Um, so you don't you just get a new data frame back. Of course, uh, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to each one. Um, it's up for your own preferences to decide which one you like. Thanks. Um, another one. Can you give trade confirmation emails control to account holder rather than API company? Can you repeat that? Can you give trade confirmation emails control to account holder rather than API company? Trade confirmation emails to the control of the account holder. I, I could you repeat that one more time? I still don't really understand. Maybe you could clarify a bit more the person who read about the question. I don't, I, I don't really understand the, the what the question is asking. Great. Let's answer another one. Meanwhile, um, oh, yeah. wait, I... wait, does Alpaca offer an API endpoint that shows top X movers or similar like other trading platforms? Um, not as of now. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So he's saying if customer is using API company for auto trading. Giving control of email notification to account holder rather than API company. If the customer is using the API company for auto trading. Okay. So you want, so it's about trade confirmation emails. And so um, maybe I can just describe what trade confirmation emails look like. So you can set it that every after the end of every trade you get uh, when every trade has been uh, successfully executed or submitted um, you do get a confirmation email and this email is sent to the email address that's associated with your account um yeah i i still don't i'll be honest i still don't really understand the question I th about how it's related to a company um but if you can sign up for a brokerage account under a company. So if you have a, a fund, right, you can sign up as a fund or a business and you can use your business email in that way. Okay. Um, okay. There's another, I did see there is an advantage to depositing 2K, I think, added options or something. Um, there might have been a promo. Uh, I'm not sure. But I, I know there's instant deposits. Maybe that's what you're talking about. So the instant deposits, uh, if I deposit one thousand dollars, it'll instantly be fun, uh, instantly be available in my account for trading. Um, any amount above one thousand dollars, we'll have to wait for that uh, transaction to go through. Okay. Um, if limit order. It's not allowed on fraction. What is the best way to execute order and make sure the trade will be open as expected? I tried to use market data, ask price and bid price, but the market order was executed with a totally different price. So could you say that? One? So you want to get, could you repeat that one more time? Just didn't catch the last part. So he's asking if the limit order is not allowed on fraction, what is the best way to execute order and make sure the trade will be open as expected? So you want to get like the expected fill, right? Um, it's kind of one of the downsides of market orders, right? So, you know, you can always round down or round up. Um, of course, this this like affects maybe like portfolio proportions you might you might be aiming for. So maybe you're aiming for like seven percent is like Apple, right? And that comes out to like be eighteen point seven shares. Um, Unfortunately, if you're looking for really good fills, right, or a specific fill, market orders are probably not the way to go with fractional orders. So fractional shares. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of just the limit. It's kind of just the drawback there of fractional shares, right? You might not get the best fill that's out there um, or like the exact fill rather, right? With a limit order, you can. Okay. Um... Okay, let's this one. Uh, is there an API endpoint to see when a security 
keeps going down. When is security or crypto first start starting trading? Um, how how do we query the onboarding date of securities? Cool. So you can actually, I believe, using the assets endpoints. So let's take a look at that. Uh, getting all assets. I think we have a bit of time, so we should be able to do this. Um, I'll create this extra code here. Okay, so the assets endpoint is different from the positions endpoint. It returns information about the assets. So over here, um, I want to get a specific asset, let's say. Uh, and let's look into reference and get a specific asset and I can do it by symbol. So get assets and I just put in a symbol or asset ID. The symbol is easier to know because asset ID is usually some uh, UUID that isn't easily, isn't easy to remember. So we don't actually need this. And then we just need to provide get asset. So let's say I want to look at when, I don't know, app, let's look at some details about Apple and see if we can, what, what information we can find out about Apple there. Um, there's the asset class symbol. It's active, whether it's actively tradable, whether it's fractionable, um, right over here. So we don't have the date actually of that it's listed. Um, it's just not one of the pieces of information we have, but we do have other things, whether it's shortable, easy to borrow, um, marginable, et cetera, and active. Um, there's one last thing I did want to go over before we wrap up. Uh, it's one more functionality rather. Um, it's we can manage our account from our uh, fr from our API directly. So these are things like you know getting our buying power, uh, getting our day trading counts, um, the margin available we have, and we can also configure our account like setting the pattern day trading protection or preventing shorting in our account. So let's take a look at what that looks like from the API. So if I go to trading here, and this falls under trading because it, it pertains to our trading account. So retrieving account details, and we just want to get this part of our trading client one more time. And if I print out the details, Hold up, can I zoom out here and it'll fix it? Okay, I have an idea. Uh, I was really hoping that it would be a little bit more easily viewable here since it was before, but essentially we can, we can still go through this. So, you know, we have the, how much buying power we have, how much cash, uh, the total amount of our portfolio, whether we've been flagged as a pattern day trader, um, you know, things that we need to, things that will come up useful when we're creating our automated trading strategy, right? Like if you want to, if you want to place a trade, let's say a new position, usually it's some percentage of your account, right? Or you would want to know how much cash you have so you can buy that security. So usually you will be using this endpoint a lot, right? To see what your state of your account is so you can find out what actions you can take. So this one's really useful and it'll probably come up a lot. Okay. Um, let's see this one. Um, okay. Is the data exactly the same for paper trading and live account trading in terms of delay and so on? For market data? For market uh, data? Yeah, paper and trading. Oh, so market data has no difference, uh, right? Because market data doesn't pertain to live or paper. It's just market data. Um, and the value of your positions is determined what their paper or live is, will be determined, right? By the market data. Um, there's no delay as far as I know. So it's, it's kind of like a sandbox environment that you can really like push the, really like test your strategy um, and see how it would perform with the live account. Of course, there is one caveat when you fill orders, right? It'll always fill, right? In in the real trading environment, it might not fill. Um, when I say always fill, meaning like 
um, there's no simulated liquidity, right, in the markets, in, in the paper trading, uh, uh, in the paper trading account, right? Uh, you might, there's no fraction, there's no partial fills, uh, etc. Things like that. Okay. Um, can you please explain the limitation of the live account in terms of money limit? Example, can I have, let's say 300 in the account and make trading with no limit in number of transactions per day? This I would use to get knowledge learned while using fractional transaction in $1 value. Could you, could you repeat that one more time? Can you please explain the limitation of the live account in terms of money limit? Um, an example is I have, let's say 300 in the account and make trading with no limit in number of transactions per day. Oh, I see. Um, so there's no minimum. Uh, so you can, you can have an account with $10 in it. Um, the limit pertains to trading stocks, right? There's a pattern day trading limit, and this is not with respect to Alpaca at all. This is a, um, like across all brokerages limit and essentially you can't buy or sell buy and sell the same stock buying and selling the same stock counts as a day trade when you do it in the same day doing that more than four times in a week marks as a patent day trader um, and if you're under twenty five thousand dollars in capital and marked as a patent day trader you can't open new positions i believe so that's that's the limit but in crypto it shouldn't apply so if you're just sticking your crypto i think you should be fine Okay. Um, another one related, uh, do we need to pay fee for limit order? Um, there are no commission fees for stocks. Or, um, if you're talking about stocks and crypto. Um, okay. So like, if you want to learn more about the fees, I would go to Alpaca fees, right. Um, and really learn about, uh, where, you know, there's some small fees that might show up for like, uh, SEC, or uh, exchange related fees and they're like fractions of a cent usually, but there's no commission we take on trades. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Another one says Rahul mentioned that the time frame is customizable using the get data function. Do we have the same option on the dashboard as well? And what is the minimum time frame that is available? One second, two seconds, et cetera. So that's the thing on the dashboard. I, it's not as customizable as it is on the um, API, right? Because on the API, you can programmatically just uh, put, tell the API exactly what you want. Uh, and the dashboard is limited by the UI. So, and the minimum time frame is one minute, I believe for bars for candlesticks. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, how fast the transactions are getting executed compared to other APIs? Is there an option to select the routing method? So the transaction speeds, we just upgraded our order management system. So we have really fast uh, fills actually. Um, and I believe it's in the order of like milliseconds, like tens of milliseconds, 10, 20 milliseconds. Um, so, we also have to be aware of like the, the, the latency when you're filling orders via API isn't just the uh, on alpaca side. It also is also determined by your internet connection, right? So the, the your your request has to traverse through the internet, and then once it's received by alpaca, it takes only a few milliseconds. I believe it's less than ten milliseconds to uh, uh, to be successfully be submitted. Okay, um, I'm going to share the link for the Slack channel for this live algo trading in the uh, chat section. You guys can join. Um, okay, will the market data API return an error if the time period requested has no data for a stock? Could you repeat that? Will the market that data API return an error if the time period requested has no data for a stock? Oh, I see. Um, so 
this is a bit nuanced. I believe, you know, let's let's just test it out, right? Let's just let's just give it a good old try here. Um, so we know a stock that just recently listed. Let's say, um, what is it, Robinhood? Hood. And we know that Robinhood didn't exist, and as a as a ticker in 2016. So let's let's give a shot what that looks like. Uh, none type exactly. So it's it just returns a none type. Um, yeah, so it'll, it'll throw an error. Okay, thanks. Um, let me look for it. Okay, and they there are a few um, users asking if you can share this Jupyter notebook. Yeah, definitely. Um, We'll get it to you guys either through the Slack channel or via email. Okay, just make sure that you do join the Slack channel that I sent in the chat section. Um, as are there any more questions now that we're in the live Q and A? So it's important to note that all the stock, all the data that we, all the code rather, we just wrote. I just copy and pasted essentially from the documentation. So you can always get it there. The only bit of code that I kind of had it here beforehand is this Plotly code, which is not too hard to find if you just Google like Plotly OHLC. Uh, you'll be able to find this code. That's how I got it. Um, can you show us the page that shows which countries are supported by us? I think there is yeah. South African um, asking whether they need a U.S. bank account. Yeah, but, um, let's see. There should be a list here for which countries, although I don't know off the top. Oh, here we go. It might be here. For non-US residents. I would look around. I it's, it's hidden somewhere here in the FEQs, but um it's definitely here. But it's it's many different countries. Um so I I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if your country is on it. Awesome, thanks. Oh, we actually shared the link in in the chat. Okay. Awesome. Um, I don't see any new questions in the questions box. Um, is is this all, Rahul? Are we done with the coding? So yeah, we're done with the coding part. We can kind of jump over to what's left. The with the market data codes. Okay. So. Okay. Um, Okay, the questions box, I think we're, we're done with that. Um, these are some resources um, that can help all of you. I think we're gonna send this um, presentation to all of you. Um, I don't know if you want to talk more about this documentation. Yeah, so these are just uh, some, of course we have the documentation we just talked about and we have some communities you can join. Uh, but we also have, I also put some of my uh, favorite part, favorite places on the internet to kind of learn about algo trading and read uh, articles. So for example, like Reddit, our algo trading has a cool, lot of cool content there, but there's also Quantipressi. Um, there's some blogs here and some book lists. We hope this was really helpful for all of you. And we tried to answer as many questions as we could. There were a lot, so we appreciate you being um, active with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raul, for explaining everything to us and answering the questions. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.